live from London. This is The World Today. Hello, I'm Robin Dwyer. Welcome to the programme. Our top stories. Claims and counterclaims. Ukraine says its troops are advancing near Bakhmut, a claim backed up by the head of Russia's mercenary group. But Russia says it's thwarted a major Ukrainian offensive in Donetsk, while Kyiv says it doesn't know about an attack. Sudan's ceasefire ends with renewed fighting and reports of increased looting in the capital, Khartoum. And trains are running again, but many victims are still unidentified after India's worst rail disaster in 20 years. Russia claims it has thwarted a large-scale Ukrainian attack in the southeastern region of Donetsk. The Russian Defense Ministry released video of what it said showed several Ukrainian armored vehicles being hit and said 250 Ukrainian troops were killed. Ukraine's armed forces have not confirmed whether they've started their long-awaited counteroffensive. Meanwhile, the commander of Ukraine's ground forces says they're moving forward near the battleground city of Bakhmut. It comes as the head of the pro-Russian Wagner mercenary group also said that ground had been lost there by Russia, with Ukrainian forces retaking part of a nearby village. Well, let's talk now to our correspondent, uh, Stuart Smith, who's in Moscow for us. Uh, so, Stuart, what's the latest from the Kremlin? Well, for the first time, we got an indication from the Ministry of Defence, mostly, about what happened on Sunday and what it believes was what it called a Ukrainian large-scale offensive. It said that this took place on five fronts, indeed in southern Donetsk, but that despite the intention of the Ukrainian armed forces being to, quote, break through Russian defences in the most vulnerable part of the front, the Kremlin says that that was ultimately unsuccessful on all counts. And as well as uh, killing Ukrainian soldiers to the tune of 250 there, elsewhere along the front lines, it said it killed hundreds more. A really major battle then taking place, but one shrouded in secrecy by the Ukrainians and only being reported on now on Monday by the Russian Ministry of Defense. It didn't say whether it believed officially this is the beginning of some counter-attack, but it did use the phrase large-scale offensive. Now, over on Belgorod, Russian territory, there's also action going on there. This is part of a pattern of Ukrainian or pro-Ukrainian incursions into the territory. Russia calls them reconnaissance and saboteur groups. Now around 4,000 Russian residents have had to be evacuated from the border there. Ukraine denies that its forces are anything to do with this. But there are hints that some of the European allies that have been providing weapons to Ukraine are not on board with this. Belgium, for example, has opened an investigation into whether its weapons that were given to Ukraine only only to be used on Ukrainian territory were actually being used as part of those offensives on Russian territory. So some jitters in some European capitals about these latest types of attack. And Stuart, uh, Russia has started drills in the Baltic Sea. What can you tell us about that? That's right. Just one day after NATO started its naval drills, Russia has responded with what it says is 40 ships and boats, 25 aircraft and helicopters and around 3,500 personnel. It's slightly less than the NATO deployment. But remember, NATO includes many more countries. Russia just won. And it's going to be, it says, trying to increase the level of readiness of military command in the Baltic. The reason it has an interest there is Russia borders the Baltic with the city of St. Petersburg on the coast. But now with Finland joining NATO and Finland taking part for the first time in these NATO drills, Russia feeling very encircled in the Baltic. It's always been a priority to keep that clear for its military. And NATO, it says, is providing a big threat in its west, uh, west part of the country. Over in the Far East, there's also Pacific drills beginning on Monday, so around eight time zones across the world. Its military in the Pacific says they'll be conducting military drills too, even larger ones, this time with 60 warships and support ships, it says. Now, we've not heard from Tokyo, but usually Tokyo finds these very uncomfortable as Russia and Japan do have a territorial dispute over a set of islands still contested after the end of World War II. Stuart, uh, thank you very much. That's our correspondent, uh, Stuart Smith, who is in Moscow for us. The head of the United Nations nuclear watchdog says Iran is only cooperating with a fraction of its commitments under an inspection deal agreed in March. 
Rafael Grossi says that while Tehran had made some positive moves, its stockpile of enriched uranium has risen by over 25% in three months. Well, let's talk now to our correspondent, Johannes Fleschberger, who's in Vienna. Uh, so, Johannes, uh, there's been some new criticism of Iran. Yes, indeed. Well, uh, just a few months ago, Iran and the IEA actually found an agreement on how to continue and develop the monitoring program of Iran's uh, nuclear program. But according to Director General Rafael Grossi, only a few cameras have been installed, and this is only a fraction of what pa both parties, according to him, agreed on. Uh, let's listen to what Rafael Grossi said earlier today. After my visit to Tehran, uh, in uh, early March, a joint statement was uh, agreed, and we have been starting the implementation of it. Some progress has been made, but not at the level, pace, and sustained uh, rhythm that I would expect. The inventory of a rich uranium is growing at a very uh, fast uh, pace, and the activities are also growing. So what is interesting, though, is that just a few days ago, the IEA said that the Iran has given a satisfactory answer regarding the uranium particles they found at one of the three sites in Iran. Um, and uh, the uh, Israeli president, Netanyahu, uh, responded that those are lies, that uh, the IEA should not believe Iran, and that the IEA is actually uh, capitulating uh, towards the pressure um, um, done by Iran. Now, Grossi responded to uh, those concerns, saying that uh, the IA is used to, these, uh, to this criticism and that those, the answer the, uh, the, which Iran has provided is plausible but not impossible. And, Johannes, there's also been uh, some discussion about the uh, Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, hasn't there? Yes. So Rafael Grossi said today that there is a major support for his safety plan for Europe's biggest nuclear power plant, which is in Ukraine, and where heavy fighting around this plant is going on. And actually, a few days ago, the uh, Russian atomic energy agency Rosatom said that Russia is following this plan. Although the IEA said that uh, risks have risen in the past months, offsite power was knocked off about seven times. And another big topic here at the Board of Governors, Governors meeting here in Vienna is uh, Japan's plan to uh, um, discharge uh, um, waste of water from the Fukushima power plant into the Pacific. Several countries in the region have voiced their concerns about safety and uh, the IEA acknowledge, acknowledges this and said that there are political discussions going on as also within the Board of Governors and in the upcoming days two reports will be issued by the IEA concerning these concerns around the Fukushima wastewater release. Johannes, thank you very much. Our correspondent, Johannes Fleschberger in Vienna. A top U.S. diplomat is in Beijing for talks amid continued security tensions with China. Vice Foreign Minister Ma Jiaoshu has been meeting officials from the U.S. Departments of East Asian and Pacific Affairs and White House National Security Council. It follows a major security summit in Asia in which both sides accused each other of undermining security in the Asia-Pacific. Over the weekend, a Chinese warship sailed close to a U.S. destroyer in the Taiwan Strait, something Beijing insists was correct procedure. The truth is that the United States was the first to provoke trouble, and China then acted lawfully. China always respects the freedom of navigation and overflight, guaranteed to all countries under international law. Actions taken by the Chinese military are a necessary response to the provocations of relevant countries, and they're completely reasonable, legal, safe, and professional. Turkey has sent troops to Kosovo in response to a NATO request to join its peacekeeping mission after unrest in the northern region. The clashes were sparked by the installation of ethnic Albanian mayors in Serb-majority regions. The Serb population had largely boycotted the April election, where turnout was less than 4%. Around 60 schoolgirls are in hospital after being poisoned at their school in northern Afghanistan. Police haven't confirmed who is behind the incident or the substance used. The Taliban clamped down on female education when it returned to power. In Afghanistan, girls are banned from education from the age of 12. An Australian woman who's been in jail for 20 years over the deaths of her four infant children has been pardoned. 
It comes after a recent inquiry found that they may have died from natural causes. The case has been described as one of Australia's greatest miscarriages of justice. You're watching CGTN Still Ahead. Trains are running again in eastern India as an official investigation is launched into the country's worst rail disaster in 20 years. Ever wondered what's the difference between a bear and a bull market? Where are the cash cows? And who are the lame ducks? And what exactly are black swans? Grey rhinos? And unicorn companies? Make sense of it all with global business, only on CGTS. There's a new agenda for a new world, accelerating change in almost every part of our lives. It's shifting the norms of how we work, travel, and connect. How we think, interact, and develop. It's a new reality, a new agenda with me, Juliet Mann. Welcome back. A reminder of our headlines. Ukraine says its troops are advancing near Bakhmut, a claim backed up by the head of Russia's mercenary group. But Russia says it's thwarted a major Ukrainian offensive in Donetsk, while Kyiv says it doesn't know about an attack. Fighting has intensified in Sudan's capital Khartoum after a ceasefire deal expired. Local residents say shelling hit western areas of Khartoum this morning. The conflict has led to widespread damage and looting. Officials have pleaded with warring factions to preserve historical artefacts. The fighting is now in its eighth week and has forced more than a million people to flee their homes. Well, let's talk to our correspondent, Naba Mohyadeen, who's in Madani in uh, east-central Sudan. Uh, so, Naba, what's the latest uh, situation on the ground in Sudan? Uh, actually, fighting is still going on in the capital Khartoum in different areas, including central Khartoum, northern and south Khartoum. Fierce clashes are witnessed, and people are reporting a dire uh, humanitarian situation after the ceasefire expired. This morning, there was fighting in uh, south Khartoum neighborhoods, uh, including Jebra, As Sahafa, and there was deadly clashes between the RSF and the military. Also, in Darfur, war-torn region, there was fighting that killed at least 40 people. Uh, in two localities, so the situation is uh, really fragile and it's intensified after the ceasefire expired, uh, not only in the capital Khartoum but also in Darfur, so the situation is not uh, uh, improving at all and the number of people, the displaced people is increasing as the fighting is still impacting millions of people in the capital and across Sudan. So we're now into uh, the eighth week of this conflict. Uh, how are people coping uh, with uh, the continuing fighting? Actually, people are so frustrated with the continuation of the fighting and they think uh, they lose the, uh, the hope or the glamour of hope that they had before with the uh, peace talks in Jeddah. Now they think the two sides are not quitting the fighting and the two sides are uh, escalating. The two warring factions want to win this battle. So people are frustrated and they, th they feel they are trapped. The people in the capital, uh, people who cannot uh, flee from the capital for their own purposes are so frustrated and upset and uh, people across Sudan they are feeling that uh, this fighting will not uh 
will not stop soon so they are trying to cope with the situation uh, to cope with the situation and starting new life elsewhere we are seeing businesses uh, established uh, in different areas we are seeing businessmen who were uh, who had uh, factories in Khartoum they are establishing and launching new businesses in other regions including Al Jazeera state and northern state where I'm staying right now uh, in Al Jazeera so people are not feeling that this fighting will um, will stop soon and students school students are resuming their classes in other regions where they are located and displaced so people are frustrated and they don't uh, feel that the suicides would will escalate soon they only uh, put hopes on the international community to push on the two generals to stop this chaotic for uh, this uh, chaotic war but they don't think uh, this will end uh, very soon so we've had a number of these uh, limited uh, ceasefires now with renewed fighting afterwards is there any sign of a resolution to this? Uh, actually, with the uh, fighting uh, uh, erupting all over again and the two sides are escalating, uh, the RSF is trying to control the military bases in uh, Umdurman and the military is forcing the RSF to withdraw from the capital and now they are uh, relocating in uh, Eastern City. We are not seeing any signs of a soon relief. And actually, not only Sudanese people or analysts or uh, journalists, but also international community, they feel that the two sides are are not uh, um willing to put the the guns very soon the Saudi Arabia and the United States the two countries that brokered the uh, uh, the deal they they think the two sides are just escalating the situation and they are calling them to uh, escalate and sit on negotiation tables and we also saw the US threatening with new sanctions against uh, uh, anyone who is escalating the situation in Sudan and against uh, uh, some of the military and the RSF uh, companies in the country so that means uh, the U.S. and the Saudi Arabia and the international community are not seeing any uh, soon relief and they are pushing in other ways to, uh, to push on the generals to stop uh, this chaotic war. So there is no sign of uh, a soon relief unless the two generals adhere to uh, people's aspiration and the international community calls to stop it and to sit on negoti uh, negotiation tables and uh, to make a political compromise uh, to get things back on track in Sudan. Naba, thank you very much. That's our correspondent Naba Mohideen in Madani in Sudan. India has launched an official investigation into its deadliest rail crash in over two decades after preliminary findings pointed to signal failure. Trains are now running again in the eastern district of Balasore after Friday's high-speed collision. Officials say that around 100 victims have yet to be identified. At least 275 people were killed when a passenger service hit a stationary freight train before being struck by an oncoming express. Over 1,000 people were injured. Well, let's talk now to our correspondent, Ravinder Bawa, who's in Odisha State. Uh, so, Ravinder, what progress has there been on identifying the remaining victims? Well, that's becoming a challenge now because, firstly, it is becoming difficult to preserve these bodies. A while back, we were talking to the health workers who spend most of their time inside this mortuary uh, dealing with these bodies. They are saying that they can now see the decomposition happening at a faster rate. There are maggots in the bodies. There are, uh, you know, they are, although there is a lot of arrangement for ice and embalming has been done, but preservation is now becoming a challenge also because the temperatures here in Odisha are quite high, it's humid, so it's difficult to preserve them. What the protocol says uh, that the government will wait for 96 hours and the deadline for that has, uh, will be finishing tomorrow, that is Tuesday at 7 o'clock in the evening at the time of the accident. Only then there will be a decision made by the government whether there will be a mass cremation. In the meantime, what the authorities are doing, that all these bodies which have not been identified as yet, and it is difficult because most of them are disfigured, there are some body parts and the whole body is not intact, so it is becoming difficult to identify. In those cases, the DNA sampling is being done so that later if claimants come, the DNA sample will be 
matched with the family members and then uh, all the compensation procedures will be followed accordingly uh, as the administration has laid down. So all these challenges are there but at the same time arrangements are being made to hand over the body to the families and ambulances have been arranged for each body to be sent uh, back with the family to their respective homes and villages wherever they are. So all this is going on. It is a, a cri time of crisis for all the health workers as well as the administration because they are here 24 hours while the trauma and the tragedy for the families is very serious because in the sense that they are running from one hospital to the other finally to find their loved one in a mortuary is a torturous experience and we have seen that in the last few days being here outside this mortuary. Back to you. Ravinda Bawa in Odisha State, thank you very much. Honduras has appointed its first ambassador to China. The two countries established diplomatic ties in March after the Central American country broke off relations with Taiwan. Our correspondent Li Jianhua has been speaking to its foreign minister and he asked him how people in Honduras view the country's ties with China. This starting of relation has been very positive for, for Honduras because uh, I think uh, the Honduran people uh, understand the, the important role in China in the international uh, field and also culturally uh, we will have uh, a new approach for the relations with China. Uh, on, on the agreements that we expect to, to sign with uh, our Chinese counterpart, it will be very important to add these possibilities related to uh, one, to cultural exchange, uh, so the Honduran people can learn more about the Chinese history and culture and, the, and their contribution to, 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 the, to the world. And also, China could understand and learn about the Honduran culture uh, and history. Uh, I think it will be a very important link uh, for two countries in a very uh, uh, separate uh, continents that can join and, and, and work together. And how do you see the comment that Central America and the Caribbean is the backyard of the United States? And do you think that China is boosting its influence in that region? Well, I think uh, Latin America has changed over the years in Central America and the Caribbean. Unfortunately, yes, we cannot deny that in the uh, past, in the 20th century and at the end of the 19th century, uh, unfortunately, the countries in the region has uh, been uh, playing a role uh, that is directed to the influence and, and, and intervention of uh, former U.S. Uh, governments. But I think uh, Latin America has changed over these years. In particular, the government of President Castro is, is seeking to improve uh, and to respect uh, that the Honduras has, is respected in their sovereignty, their internal decision, the autodetermination of the Honduran people. And I think uh, this will be the, the pathway to, to development. And, and these uh, principles are respected by China. And looking ahead, what are the future prospects for the Honduras-China relationship? And what steps is Honduras taking to enhance cooperation in the coming years? Are we looking at some new projects? Yes, indeed. I think we have uh, 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 certain priorities uh, that are directed to develop new possibilities for the Honduran people, uh, fighting poverty, fighting against exclusion, uh, fighting for the equality of the Honduran people, and, and fighting many problems that we have faced in, in historically. And I think China, as I mentioned, uh, will prove a, a very important role in developing new possibilities, uh, new possibilities for enhancing the Honduran economy, enhancing its development, and also the capabilities of find new infrastructural uh, projects that can change this reality, mainly in the issues of transport, ports, and, and energy. The Marshall Islands is one of the least visited countries on the planet. The Pacific Island nation is economically reliant on the United States. And while it has plenty of natural beauty, living there isn't paradise for everyone. Our correspondent Greg Navarro reports. From the air, it's easy to see how isolated the Marshall Islands is. Just 181 square kilometers of land spread out over nearly 2 million square kilometers of ocean. On the ground, the capital city of Majuro is full of activity, often moving at a slower pace. Here in Marshall, we live 
Lunu. But this man said, we all live together. That's certainly true in the capital city of Majuro here, situated on an atoll, which is essentially an island that rings around a lagoon. Over the last 50 years, the population has increased from 3,000 to 30,000, but not the limited amount of land, just meters wide in some places. That's prompted the government here to reclaim land from the sea. This sporting complex is the latest project to give people more space for recreation and help create a greater buffer between the rising sea and homes. The country's greatest resource is the water that surrounds it. This is where we take our food and sometimes we go out and fishing. And it's a central part of life here. But fishing and agriculture only account for a portion of the country's economy. About 60% comes from the United States. While the Marshall Islands is no longer a U.S. territory, it still relies heavily on U.S. financial assistance. In the 1950s and 60s, the U.S. tested 67 nuclear bombs on two neighboring atolls. The health and environmental impacts are still being felt here today. The U.S. established a victim's compensation trust fund, but some people say not enough money has gone to the victims and their families. I think the main key in moving forward with this discussion is to address their issue and their needs because uh, I feel like their voices have been heard lately. They've been... Uh, they've been ignored. Poverty and unemployment are high here. The country's infrastructure is basic. But the people who live here are resilient, including A.J. Loyak, who lives on the edge of the Pacific with his uncles. Um, what I love most about live here is this beautiful sunset, sunrise. In a country that clearly stands out on its own. Greg Navarro, CGTN, Majuro. Thousands of France's brainiest bookworms have attended a mass spellathon on the Champs Elysees. 1,800 desks were laid out on Paris's most famous boulevard. The organizers were hoping to break the world record for a dictation spelling competition, with participants asked to transcribe a text as it was read to them. While the spelling bee created a lot of buzz, more than 50,000 people applied to take part. The headlines again. Claims and counterclaims. Ukraine says its troops are advancing near Bakhmut, a claim backed up by the head of Russia's mercenary group. But Russia says it's thwarted a major Ukrainian offensive in Donetsk, while Kyiv says it doesn't know about an attack. And Sudan's ceasefire ends with renewed fighting and reports of increased looting in the capital Khartoum. And that is the world today. Thanks for watching. We'll be back with more news at the top of the hour. Coming up next, it's World Insight. For now, from all of the team in London, it's goodbye. Hello and welcome to the weather forecast. I'm Tiani. Well, over to Europe. There could see pretty widespread but scattered rainy spells here across the majority of Europe over the next couple of days. Most of them will be in the form of some light to moderate intensity of rain with potential thunderstorms setting the stage here for portions of Italy and the Balkans as well over the next couple of days. And in terms of the temperatures development, the majority of Europe are likely to see an upper trend in high temperatures from Tuesday into Wednesday and after the rise. The majority of the western portion of Europe will see the high temperatures in the upper 20s or even in the lower 30s as we head into the latter portion of this week. About business and travel for the major cities up in the north, plenty of sunshine for Copenhagen and Stockholm with high temperatures in the 20s. And over to Minsk, we'll also see plenty of sunshine with a warmer high temperatures touching the 25 degrees Celsius mark. And here for other major cities across the western portion of Europe, Paris will see abound in the sunshine on Wednesday with high temperatures in the upper 20s and down in majority will see chance of showers with a cooler temperatures, a cooler high temperatures of 21 degrees Celsius, while the overnight low temperatures will be about 15 degrees Celsius. And here over to Berlin, we'll see pretty hot condition with high temperatures in the 30s. And over to Vienna, we'll see high of 20 and low about 13 degrees Celsius on Wednesday.
This is CGTN, China Global Television Network.